Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us in this series of talks promoted by the United States Spiritist Federation every Saturday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Today, I'm so very happy to be here to host Beatriz Lopez Bia, who will be talking to us about strange morals. But before we turn into to be, I would like to take a moment to do an, op uh, an opening prayer and uh, just invite all of us to perhaps take a moment to close our eyes and take this opportunity to open our hearts, our minds to all that is good, to connect with the spirits of light who are here present with us. Along with our benefactors, I would like to ask that Bia be blessed during this time, this talk, and all of us who are here listening to her words of wisdom. May our dear friend B receive the inspiration during this talk, and may all of us be indeed touched by the wisdom that exists in that, so be it. Bia, yeah, welcome. Thank Hope you. Hope you're doing well. <laughs> yes, you too. Thank you for having me. Very good. It is so great to have you here to talk about this topic, Strange Morals. Thank you so much, Bia. But before Bia begins her important message, uh, please allow me to formally introduce her. So Bia, or shall I say Beatriz Lopez, has been involved in many different things, all about spiritism. So she she works with spiritist study groups at uh, Allan Kardec Spiritist Center of Denbury, Connecticut, and Long Island Spiritist Center. She has been giving lectures. She also delivered a speech at the United, United Nations. And most recently, she's been helping to coordinate a youth spiritist retreat. Thank you so much, Bia. Thank you. Bia has a bachelor's degree in applied mathematics and statistics, and she works as a quantitative consultant at Mass Mutual. I would like to take this moment to remind everyone in the audience to please send your questions to Bia via chat. We will allow time for that once uh, she concludes her presentation. So Bia, please take it away. Thank you so much for that introduction. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. I'm excited to go over this topic. As the title suggests, it is a strange moral. It's a strange topic, but hopefully by the end of this, we can get a little clarity on that topic. So in the Gospel According to Spiritism, as you could see, this is chapter 23. So the Gospel According to Spiritism, it gets the messages and the teachings from the Gospel and elaborates them to give us a better explanation of things that we might have misinterpreted or didn't understand. Well, in this chapter, the strange morals, it'll bring some teachings of, um, of Jesus that seem at first, right, very strange. They seem like they don't make sense and you're very taken aback when you first read them or if you read them literally. So we'll take a look at why um, these are misinterpreted, how they're misinterpreted and what the real meaning behind them is. So the first thing to take note is that written after his death, so this is straight from the, um, the gospel according to spiritism. So written after his death, because none of the gospels were written during his lifetime. So let's just pause right there. So that already shows that the four gospels that we're um, going to talk about in a little bit, they were written after Jesus' lifetime. So imagine right now I'm giving this lecture and then in a few years, you're going to rewrite what I wrote. Of course, there's going to be some um, some disconnect, right? Maybe something you forgot or misinterpreted or whatever it might be. It might not come out exactly the way that I said it. And it's also important to note that if they were written after his death, that means that Jesus himself did not directly write these gospels. And we'll go and see who did write these gospels. So, and then continuing on with what they say here, one may be led to believe that in this case, the depth of his thoughts were not well expressed. Again, right, makes sense that if it was written not by Jesus and after his lifetime, maybe they didn't 
really capture what Jesus was trying to say. And maybe they misinterpreted or um, weren't able to explain it in a way that um, made sense to us. Or what is no less probable, so another um, option here is that the original meaning may have suffered an alteration in passing from one language to another. So as we know, the Bible has been translated into many, many, many languages. And along that comes with so many translations and editing along the way. So from that, we can find a lot of misinterpretation in different meanings of different languages or even in the same language at different time periods. So we're also going to take a deeper dive into that concept of how languages can affect our understanding. It is enough for an error to be committed just once for it to be repeated in subsequent copies as seen so often regarding historical facts. So again, they're just elaborating that if that if someone makes a mistake one time in a translation or they translate something literally and they don't get the figurative meaning, that might spread into other translations and lots of translations. And from there, we have this growing issue. So this is a common thing that happens, not only with the Bible, not only with these morals of Jesus, but it happens all over the world all the time. So let's talk a little bit about the four evangelists. So the four evangelists were the four people who wrote the, the four gospels. So the first is Matthew. So Matthew was a Roman tax collector. Um, and because of this, not a lot of people liked him. So one day Jesus passed by him and called to Matthew to come follow me. And without hesitation, Matthew dropped everything, went and followed Jesus. And he became one of the 12 disciples. Then we go on to Mark. So Mark, he was a very young boy when he met Jesus. So his parents were very involved in learning about Jesus's teachings, but Mark was still very young. So he was never one of the disciples. After Jesus's death, and, and Mark was older at that point, Mark went and worked with the disciple Peter in spreading Jesus's teachings all over the world. So here we can see that Mark, even though he met Jesus, his main teachings and learnings from Jesus came later on from the disciple Peter when he was a little bit older. So we can see here that he didn't have as much of a direct connection with Jesus. And again, we are getting, um, we can see where we can come into some errors and misinterpretations or writing something maybe incorrectly. Then we have Luke. So Luke, he was a phys physician and he was converted in the early years of Christianity. So Luke actually never met Jesus, but he learned from, from Mary, the mother of Jesus, and from all the articles and talk that was being said at that time about Jesus. So again, Luke here, he did not directly meet Jesus and did not directly experience these teachings, but heard it from other sources. So again, we can see where there could be some disconnect of what Jesus actually said and was trying to say to what got translated and what got written down. And then lastly, the we have John. And John was known as the beloved disciple and he was one of the youngest apostles. So just to give a little uh, clarity in those definitions. So disciple means students. So the 12 disciples that we commonly talk about, those were the students of Jesus. They were learning Jesus's teachings. And then the apostles are people who spread the message, right? They send the message on. So getting what Jesus said and spreading it to the world and teaching others. So a lot of the times, right? These disciples are also become apostles. So that's what it's saying here. So he was the beloved disciple, the beloved student, and he was one of the he was the youngest apostle to go out and spread the word of Jesus. And he was so beloved that Jesus entrusted him to take care of Mary, again the mother of Jesus, after Jesus's death. So he was you could tell here he was always by Jesus's side and he always he was witnessing most of these things firsthand. And so Again, we can see the difference in where all of these four evangelists are coming from and how 
we see how right things could be misinterpreted or written incorrectly and then we add translation on top of that and the spreading of word to mouth and so many things can get twisted and misinterpreted along the way. So in the book on the way on the way to the light they have this section about the redaction of the definitive text. So first off, what does redaction mean? Redaction is the process of editing text. So again, right, editing, translating, and even in the same language, if we were to read something in English from William Shakespeare, we need translation, even though it's in English, because it is a very different type of English that we don't use today. So that process of editing and um, working on the text, the physical words. And here it says, the grandeur of the doctrine does not lie within the circumstances of the gospel, actually being those of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It lies in the immortal beauty that radiates from their divine lessons, which have attracted souls down through the ages. So here they're saying, these were the words, right? The words that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that they wrote. But that's not what we have to focus on. We don't have to focus on the exact words, the exact literal translation. What we need to understand is Jesus's teachings, those divine lessons that are that he was trying to share that are immortal. They apply to us back then, they apply to us now, and they will apply to us in the future. And we are still learning from that and still, um, still using that in our lives. So that's what it's saying here. There are these literal translations and people misinterpret it and they want to take things literally. But What's important, again, is getting that divine lesson from it, because that divine lesson is what we need to understand and apply into our lives and work on. So now getting into the chapter of the strange morals in the gospel, according to spiritism. So here they bring four different um, messages, four different morals, strange morals. So the first is whoever does not hate his father and mother. Two, forsaking father, mother, and children, which means abandoning. Forsaking means abandoning. Three, leave to the dead the care of burying their dead. And four, I have not come to bring peace, but division. So immediately off the bat, right, we read these and we look at them literally and you think, how could Jesus ever say to abandon their father, mother, and children, right? We It doesn't make sense. That's why they're strange. That's why we're taken aback by them. Because why, why would Jesus ever say that? Why that contradicts what he was saying and all his teachings. So that's why we need to further elaborate these and dive into them to see what Jesus was really trying to get at and see why we've misinterpreted it along the way. So the first one is whoever does not hate his father and his mother. So this is the um, this is what Luke wrote, and it says, A large crowd of people was walking with Jesus when he turned to them and said, If anyone comes to me but does not hate his father and his mother, his wife and his children, his brothers and his sisters, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not want to take up his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Therefore, anyone among you who does not renounce everything cannot be my disciple. So again, we read this and it's a little confusing. Why is Jesus telling us to abandon everyone we love? What about the love, the law of love and charity and helping others? We are just abandoning all of that and just moving on and not and everything that we have, right? So it seems very strange and it's very hard to understand at first and especially when we're only looking at it literally. So let's take a look at three words right here. So in Latin, we have the word odit and excuse me if I'm pronouncing these wrong. Um, in Greek, we have the word misé and in English, we have the word hate. In English, we know that this word hate is a very, very strong word. Usually people say, oh, I don't like that. I dislike this. Um, but using the word hate is very strong. It's very intense. It's very 
aggressive, to use that word hate in English. But in what is used as a translation in Latin and Greek, these two words actually mean, actually translate to love less, to not love as much, or to not love the same. So you can see it's different to saying, oh, I love that less than this, or to say, I hate that, right? It's a very different connotation. So now let's take a look back at that sentence again, the text again. If anyone comes to me, but does not hate his father, his mother, his sister, um, everyone, right? His, even his own life. So hate, again, very, very strong word. But now let's read it with love less. If anyone comes to me, but does not love less his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. So now, right, this makes a lot more sense. Love less. It's not saying to not love at all. It's not saying to hate them, to despise them. It's saying to love less. And this goes with the first commandment, to love God above all things. So Jesus was saying, you have to love God above all things. You have to love, right, Jesus and these messages and these divine lessons above all things. It's not saying to hate your parents and your family and everything in your own life, but to love it less, right? Because loving God above all things is number one. So now when we read that, right, it makes a lot more sense. And we could see how Jesus would say that. And we can understand how it got misinterpreted with translation and with language. And then in the gospel according to spiritism, they bring a few other examples of why, of how language can be um, varied and why we can get different interpretations from the same language. So it continues. Moreover, one must take into the account the customs and characteristics of people, which influence the particular meaning of their languages. Without this understanding, the true meaning of certain words is lost. So what do they mean here? Here they mean that we have to see what the people of the time that they're talking about, whatever time period we're looking at, what was the culture at that time? What were the customs of that time? And um, for an example, there's another passage from Jesus, and we won't get into this because that could be a whole lecture when it, in and of itself, but it says, Jesus said, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of the needle, which is that little hole in the needle, than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, that is a whole lesson we can get into that we won't get into right now. But let's think of why would Jesus use a camel to go through the eye of a needle? That doesn't really seem to, I mean, I guess it shows the point that it's impossible, but why would he use that? Well, if we actually dig deeper into it, at that time, camel hair was used to make rope. So usually we know with a needle, we get a little thin, tiny thread to go through that needle. Well, in that time, what he was saying is a camel rope, so a rope this thick, would be very hard to get into a needle, right? We wouldn't be able to do it. It would be impossible. It would still be impossible, just like getting a camel, a whole camel through the eye of a needle. But we can see that it made more sense in that comparison in why Jesus said a camel. He really meant a rope, the rope that was made out of camel hair. Um, so we can see there how we have to understand the time period and what was happening at that time or else we get a completely different um, meaning. And this was okay because we still get the point. Getting a camel through the eye of a needle is even more impossible than getting a rope through the eye of a needle. So it's that concept of it's impossible. So we still have the same meaning, thankfully, so it wasn't too... Um, too detrimental, this, mis this mistake in translation and understanding, but we see how this can have an effect in our translations. And then it continues, from one language to another, the same term can be assumed, can assume different degrees of strength. It might be an insult or blasphemy in one language, but pretty insignificant in the other language. So it depends on the idea attributed to it. One big example of this is the word love. 
in English, we use the word love for everything. We say, I love broccoli. I love my shoes. I love the grass. I love everything, right? Everything we can think of, we love it. And we use it very, you know, insignificant just for liking things. But in a lot of other languages, they use love very reserved. They only use love in situations of, you know, extreme passion, extreme affection. They, they would say, I like the grass, but they would never say, I love the grass. I'm in love with the grass. So right there, right, we can see that in some languages, it's a very different strength. It's the same word. It would translate the same. But how do people use that word? That is another very tricky thing with translations and with understanding texts from a different time or from a different language. And even in the same language, certain words lose their significance over time. So we don't even have to be talking about other languages, right? Like we're talking about Shakespeare, that you need translation for Shakespeare, even though it's, it is in English. And so one uh, example here is this word myriad. So I don't know about you, but I don't even know that word myriad. So if I was reading in English and I came across that word, I would have to go and look it up. So if I look it up, right, so I already, we don't really use that word now. If I look it up, you know, if we look back decades, it means a countless or an extremely great amount. So it means a lot. Oh, I have a lot of things. I have a myriad of things. So that concept of a lot, you have a lot of it, a ton of it, a, a huge, a massive amount. We have words that we use today for that, but we don't really use myriad. But now if we look back centuries and centuries ago, a myriad actually meant a unit of 10,000. So if we're reading a, a book and we see the word myriad, now we have to think if we're talking about money, does it mean they have a lot of money or does it mean they have exactly $10,000? So there's that difference. And again, that might we might still get the same concept of it, a lot or 10,000 but we might think a lot is a million compared to 10,000, right? So there's that difference and we need to understand the time period that we are in, that we are reading in to understand what they were really trying to mean. And again, this is in the same language and words just trans, trans, transfer meanings over time, let alone, right? Now we're talking about other languages as well. And different translations and different meanings and over time. So, so many factors in language have come to, have been a challenge for us to understand. And then they said, that is why a strict literal translation does not always express a thought precisely. And in order to be exact, one must sometimes use equivalence or paraphrase rather than cognates. So, instead of getting a word and translating it literally, we have to start paraphrasing. If we get a joke in English and try and translate it to another language, it's not really gonna make sense in that other language, right? We have to get the concept of it rather than trying to translate it word for word, which so often happens. So now looking into the second one that they bring to us in the gospel according to spiritism forsaking father, mother, and children. So this, again, forsaking means abandoning. So already, right, why would Jesus be telling us to abandon our family? So Jesus said, and this is Matthew writing it, Jesus said, whoever has left his home or his brothers or his sisters or his father or his mother or his wife or his children or his land for my name shall receive a hundredfold and shall have eternal life as an inheritance. So it's saying, okay, if you leave everything you have, abandon your family, abandon everyone, you'll be rewarded, right? We take a step back, we're like, what? Why would Jesus say that? That doesn't seem to make sense. So again, in the Gospel According to Spiritism, again, a direct quote, it says, without arguing over words, we must look for the thought which is obvious here. So again, it's saying, let's not think about the words right now. Let's think about the thought behind it. Because again, the words we saw, the words get complicated and messed up and tricky. Let's see what the thought was. The thought is 
The interests of the future life should be placed above all human interests and considerations. So we have to place the future life, right? We have to place Jesus' teachings and God and all of that above everything else that we have, everything materialistic or our um the ties that we have here, we have to put God first, right? The same as loving God above all things that we saw. We have to put that first above our human interests. And that, okay, that makes sense in accordance with Jesus's doctrine. But if Jesus was saying, oh yeah, just go and leave your family, abandon your family. Now that would be a negation, right? That would go against what Jesus was teaching. So that wouldn't make sense. So we have to look, you know, okay, what is Jesus really trying to say here? And it brings some examples. Would anyone blame a son for leaving his family to march in defense of the country? No, right? So many people. And of course, again, we have to think of the time that this book was written because it says a son and we know that it can be any child. Um, so again, right, knowing that time period, they put a son specifically, but we know it could be any child that leaves his family and his, um, right, whichever family, his father, his mother, his siblings, his wife, his children, everyone leaves them to go serve the country. So those people, right, we see those people, and especially now in Memorial Day weekend, right, we see those people as heroes, people who um, protected us. And yeah, they did have to abandon their family to do that. They did have to leave their family, but that was a priority, right? It was the duties that are placed above others. So some things are a priority and they're more important. And We can see this even more recently today with our essential workers. Our essential workers in the beginning of the pandemic, they had to, in terms, abandon their family, right? People who were going into hospitals, they were staying at the hospital or they were sleeping in the garage or they were going somewhere else so that they wouldn't contaminate their family. And again, not that they wanted to abandon their family and we'll look and see how that affection and that bond is still there, but it was necessary, it was a priority, it was something that had to be done. And another example that they bring right in the gospel according to spiritism is, does the law not make it an obligation for the daughter to leave her parents in order to join her husband? And I thought this was a good example because it's also an example again of the time period. Right now, yes, people tend to, once they get married, they tend to leave their parents' house, but it's not a law. We don't have to do that. So again, how time has changed and how something that, you know, this was a law when this book was being written is not anymore. So again, we have to focus on what was happening at that time period. What were the customs at that time period? But when we think about it, right? Most, um, again, not that it's a law, not that it's set, but eventually most people do end up leaving their parents' house and they do, in that terms, abandon them. But what we have to see here and that they bring to us is that it, even in these heartbreaking separations, that they're necessary, but that affection is still there. That love is still there. It doesn't mean we're abandoning them and not supporting them and not loving them. We are still, right, our connections are still there, but sometimes we have to be separated. Sometimes we have to go on and do something else for the betterment of ourselves and for others. And um, I think this is, it's really tricky to understand, right, the first time we see it, but now it's saying, okay, yeah, that makes more sense, right? We're not just saying, okay, let me leave my family and never talk to them again, but we're saying, okay, yeah, some things we have to take a step back and leave our family for a second, but it's for the greater good in some point. And that's the point Jesus was trying to get across. And thankfully now, right, with the technology that we have, we don't even have to really abandon because even if we have to move somewhere else or go somewhere else, there's still so many ways for us to communicate and talk. So we're um, even moving closer to that, right? We don't even have to abandon or leave behind as much as before. And so here they bring the third um, strange moral. Again, right, the first time you read these, these are all going to be pretty strange. Leave to the dead the care of burying their dead. He said to another, follow me. But he responded, Lord, first I must go and bury my father. Jesus replied, leave to the dead the care of burying their dead. As for you, 
go and proclaim the kingdom of God. So again, so Jesus called someone to follow him. And the, the person said, I have to go bury my father. And Jesus said, no, it's okay. You can leave it. That is shocking, right? Why, why would Jesus say that? And it is very shocking when we first read it and when we read it literally. But again, we have to look at that time and what Jesus was really trying to say. Jesus teaches him by stating, do not worry about the body, but think first of the spirit. So this is a very difficult concept to understand without spiritism, but spiritism has made this a lot easier for us to understand because right, once someone, um, when someone dies from this corporeal life right now, we know that that spirit, right? We, we can long for that spirit. We can pray for that spirit to help them. But that body that we're left with, that is just the material. That is just the matter. That is what Jesus is saying, right? That that body, that is not of importance. Of course, it's still a symbol to us. And Jesus isn't saying we shouldn't respect that at all. But he's saying, right, think first of that spirit. And then it continues, go and teach the kingdom of God. Go and tell others that their true homeland is not on earth, but in heaven, for true life is found only there. So, yes, we can focus right on this person that is dead, but let's go and focus on the people who are living and spread the word for the people that are living to show them and to spread that message of God. And again, right, not saying that we have to completely abandon them, but we can pray for that spirit and we can, right, still bury um still bury those close to us. It's not saying that we can't or shouldn't at all, but it's just saying that that we we have to move on from that, from that material, right? That's just material at this point. We have to move on and focus on what we can do now um, with the living. And this is an example that I have that is a non-religious example. Um, it's a organization called From Death to Life. And it was founded where Mary Johnson Roy in 2005, after she forgave Oshia Israel, the young man in the picture, when this young man murdered her, her son. So we see here that, first of all, right, that accomplishment, but 12 years earlier. So her son, as, as boys, this man killed her son. And she could spend her whole life grieving and mourning. And of course it took her time. It took her 12 years to forgive him, but it took her that time, but she forgave him. And not only she forgave him, but they formed this organization to spread the word about ending violence and bringing the community together and healing the community. So see what she did? She said, okay, I could sit here, right? And focus on the dead on my dead son and focus on that and only mourn and cry all the time. But then what are we doing for those who are alive, who might get into a similar situation? So she changed her focus again, not saying that she can't write, pray and be, um, feel that sadness, but she turned her focus to those who are living to those that she can still help while right now, right? She, there wasn't much she could do for her son. There were those that she could still help. And, I think that's just an amazing sh story. And this is non-religious, right? And she doesn't know that that's not what she was trying to do. She wasn't trying to, you know, um, that specific religious connotation of it, but she came to that realization on her own and turned that around in a really positive way. And they still continue this organization and helping their community. And then lastly, we have the this strange moral that it brings to us. I have not come to bring peace, but division. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to separate a man from his father, a daughter from her mother, and a daughter-in-law from her mother-in-law. And a man will have as enemies those of his own house. So again, that, right, when we read that, right, how can Jesus say that he came to bring division, a sword, right? We know that we talk about, that Jesus talks about love and charity and justice and nonviolence and being peaceful. How could Jesus say, nope, I didn't mean to bring peace. I mean to 
I meant to bring battles or sword and separate people apart. So again, very, very shocking when we read it literally, and it needs a deeper dive into it. So in the Gospel according to Spiritism, it says, this is neither blasphemy nor contradictory because it was Jesus who spoke them and they bear his great wisdom. So it's saying, don't just think, oh no, maybe Jesus got it wrong. Jesus didn't get it wrong. He knew what he was saying, right? We know that he was a perfect spirit. He knew what he was saying and he said it um, for a reason. We are the ones that are misinterpreting it and getting it wrong. It is solely the form, a bit ambiguous, that does not express his thought precisely. And this fact has given rise to misunderstandings as their true meanings. So again, it's that it's a little bit vague. We can't really understand. So we go filling in the blanks and we go misinterpreting. Again, saying that it's us, but Jesus had a point that he was trying to get across and it wasn't a mistake on his part. Taken literally, they would tend to transform his holy peaceful mission into a mission of subversion and discord, which is an absurd conclusion rejected by common sense for Jesus would not have contradicted himself. So if we take that literally, we would think, okay, Jesus wants us to, to start problems, to start trouble, um, to not be peaceful. And common sense says, okay, when we think about the law of love, justice, and charity, that doesn't make sense. Jesus wouldn't be saying that. So again, we're the ones misinterpreting it. Let's take a step back and see what Jesus was really trying to say. In his profound wisdom, Jesus foresaw that they would occur, what would occur. But such things were unavoidable because they were connected to the inferiority of human nature, which could not be transformed all of a sudden. So what Jesus was really saying was not that he wanted that, not that he wanted to bring division, but he knew that as human beings with our evil tendencies, that was what's going to happen. He knew that we were going to cause conflicts, that we were going to cause divisions because he can't just come here and say, okay, be peaceful. And everyone snapped their fingers and everyone's peaceful now. No, he knew that he was bringing this message but we were gonna use it wrong and we were gonna cause conflicts and separations. He knew that was gonna happen and that's what he's saying. He said he knew that division would occur and it would not occur peacefully, not because of what he wanted. If he, if he could choose, he would want us to be peaceful, but he knew that we would start those divisions. And a quick example of this, I know um, Francis of Assisi, there's again, a lot we could talk about in this topic alone. So I won't go into a lot of details, but just um, one part of the story that I wanna tell. So Francis of Assisi, he had um, a good life, but then you know had a troubled youth, ended up going to the war and that changed his life. So he comes back from, from the war, from the military and he starts praying and looking for answers and um, helping the lepers and trying to help people and trying to change his life. And one day he heard Jesus say to him to go fix the Christian church, um, the, right? To go fix Jesus's house, he would say, go fix the Christian church. And he took that and he said, okay, I need to, you know, help Christianity. I need to improve this. I need to work on this. And at one point, though, he needed money and he ended up getting clothes from his dad's store and selling them and taking that money. And of course, his father was outraged because he took the father's um, clo clothing and material from the store. But also his father was not supporting this um, path that he was going on of supporting Christianity. So they went in front of the bishop and the bishop said, OK, yes, you do have to give back the money to your father. So he gave the money back to his father and he stripped off, off all his clothes that his father had given him. He stripped off all the clothes and gave it back and said that God is his only father now. And that, and according to records, that was the last time that they spoke, um, Francis of Assisi and his father, showing that that divide came, right? Because he realized that he needed to go and 
do this work for Christianity and do this work for Jesus. But his father, his family did not understand. And that created a division, not because Jesus wanted that division, not because Jesus wanted them to not talk, to not be together, but because of how we are as humans, that happened naturally. So this is a quick example. Again, there's a lot we can get into with Francis of Assisi, but just that quick example showing that not that that's what Jesus wanted, but that it's our human nature right now that we have more evil tendencies, that things like that are going to happen. Divisions are going to be created even within our own families. When Jesus stated, do not believe that I have come to bring peace, but division, his thought was the following. Do not believe that my doctrine will be established peacefully. It will bring bloody battles using my name as a pretext for humans will not have understood me or will not have wanted to understand me. So again, saying that he meant that he knew that it's not just gonna come and spread peacefully. People are going to cause conflicts over this. People are going to start battles and they're gonna say that it's a name of Jesus, but Jesus didn't want that, but he knew it would happen. That's what he's saying here. And again, that it is us rather for our lack of understanding, right? Cause we clearly did not understand the law of love, justice and charity. Um, if we're bringing these bloody battles or we didn't want to understand, right? We closed our minds and say, okay, yeah, we have to go to battle because it's just, that was our tendency. And that's what we were going towards, um, leaning towards. So again, showing that he knew that was going to happen. Not that that's what he wanted to happen, but knew that as humans and as the, the state of evolution that we are at, he knew that was going to happen. So those are the four strange morals that are presented in the gospel according to spiritism in this chapter 23. And it's very confusing. It's very strange at first. But I think what's important to, to see here is that even studying, even now, right, so many, so many years after these gospels were written, even now, we have the power to study and learn and to find those true meanings. Because like it said in the beginning, it's not about the exact words. It's about the teachings and the divine lessons that we're getting from the words. And that's what we're going to get and apply it into our lives and work on ourselves to better ourselves. So it's just so important that to remember that there's always more to learn and to keep learning and to keep understanding and get those teachings and apply them into our lives. And then lastly, I just wanted to leave off with a little message from the book, Happy Life. And this one's about learning. Study frees the mind from ignorance and develops discernment. Study and work are the wings that further evolution. Knowledge is the message of life. Learning is not limited to the classroom. Life itself is an open book that teaches those willing to learn. So thank you, everyone. I hope this was an opportunity for you all to learn. I know I learned a lot and know that we still have so much more to learn and understand. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Sorry, I don't know if that's me. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know that uh, yeah, I was no on mute. But I want to say to, to you and to everyone, thank you. Thank you so much, Bia. They, those words are great and, and truly enlightening. Uh, it's such a, a good discussion for all of us to have. And I want to open to everyone to send your comments, your questions via chat because we are open now. And uh, let's see if we have any questions now. Yes, we do. So let me let me read. Understanding that there may be many reasons to misinterpret Jesus' messages, how do we know what we read is credible? What do you believe, Bia, is the best way for us to, to interpret? Yeah, definitely. And that's the problem, right, is that we all interpret differently. And that's why the spirits had to come and elaborate for us in the gospel according to spiritism. So for one, I would refer to that because they specifically explained for us so that we would have a way to 
the correct interpretation we can say, mm -hmm. but also we can use our, like it said, our common sense, our reasoning of what Jesus was teaching. Say, okay, does this follow the law of love, justice, and charity? Because I think most is encompassed within that law. And if it follows those teachings, right, we know that we're, we're okay, yeah, that's credible, that's on the right path. But if it seems to go a little bit against that, then we can think, mm, let me try and interpret that again differently. Love it. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have another one that says the following. So the bottom line, exchanging the word hate by love, less, means we should love all creatures of God, environment, and all the humanitarian endeavors to prosper as equally as we love our family, our business, etc., to go well, right? Be more of a citizen of the planet. Can you talk about it? And yeah, thank you, Yasko. Ab yeah, absolutely. So exactly. We want to right, love God above all things, but we want to love everything else as well. And while we're loving God, all those things, right? Nature is from God. Our our neighbors, as we call them, right? All the people around us are creatures of God. So yeah, we want to love all of those things. And then just keeping in mind that we're loving God above all. And if we're loving God above all, those other things will naturally happen. So yeah, exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Bia. We have another one. It says the following. Thank you for explaining the idea that we would be rewarded if we forsake or abandon our father, mother, and children, especially with examples of the soldiers leaving their family to defend a country. Can you talk a little bit more, Bia, about what would that mean for us to abandon our family members to follow Jesus? Right. So, it, and that one, that I think that one's really shocking at first, right? How could we be abandoning our families? But sometimes, like we're saying, we have to. And I think we also don't have to think about it in ex in extremities, right? Not everyone can do something extreme, but maybe, you know, you have to dedicate one, one night a week to go to the center or go virtually to the center and participate in a study to learn about Jesus's teachings. And, you know, maybe there's other family activities going on, but for that second, you have to say, okay, no, this is my time that we do the study and I have to do the study and not push the study off. So I think, mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we think about very extreme cases, but we can also think in smaller cases as well. I love it. Thank you. This is a very good explanation. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the example, Bia. We have another one. Uh, the question is, do you think that mediumship played an important part in the writings of the Gospels? What do you think? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm, I definitely think it had a lot to do with it, right? those people who were writing the gospels, the four that we covered, they were definitely being supported and inspired because, right, we didn't want, and we know that the spirit world and everyone has it very planned out. We didn't want just anyone to write down anything. Um, we wanted to make sure that even after that time, they were writing down things correctly, right? And again, there's misinterpretations and translations and all of that, but um, definitely those, there were spirits helping and, um, guiding those evangelists to write, to write and spread those messages. And and I would say this is why those those messages are universal between among the four of them. Right? Mm -hmm. Many times you see the same story in yes. all four gospels. But let's see what's the next question, uh, Bia. As you were preparing this presentation, what of those passages impressed you the most? of the four uh, strange morals? Mm -hmm. I think, I think the one that impressed me the most was the abandoning, because I think that one sounds very, I think extreme when you read the literal word, word of it. But I think one that I liked um, learning about the most and I find the most interesting is the first one about hate versus love less. I think those translations, I find very interesting to see how just a simple word can change the whole meaning of the sentence. Awesome. Thank you. May I may I add something? Yeah. Bia? And it, it's not the New Testament, but uh, the Old Testament. If you if you ever remember a very um, famous, if you will, or well-known 
passage of uh, Abraham having to sacrifice his child, uh, Isaac, right? And it, it, it's something that uh, is puzzling to say the least, where mm -hmm. how would a father actually kill a child? Therefore, in those sense, how, why would a, a, a father hate enough to sacrifice and uh and it's all about loveless uh mm -hmm. uh when you when you look at the the passage with uh abraham uh worshiping the child instead of worshiping god he needed to go through that extreme if you will mm -hmm. passage to understand uh what what it is that we need to do so i i love what you've done here thank you yeah definitely that's a great example thank you <laughs> So we have another one. How do you think the phrase from Jesus, my kingdom is not of this world, can also help us understand all this strange morals? Yeah, that's a great question. So my kingdom is not of this world, right? It's saying that it's not on earth, right? A lot of the times we think so materialistically, we think so much about the here right now, and we think about what's going on in earth, but saying that the kingdom, right, is more than that, right? It's the spirit mm -hmm. world. It's above that. And I think if we are thinking about that, if we're thinking about that bigger picture and we're looking beyond just earth right now, then it makes it a lot easier for us to act on things that that are for the better good rather than just something that's good for you right now. Very good. Thank you. So let's see if there's any additional questions. So Gilda says, wonderful, great message. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Ms. Lopez. Irasema says, thank you so much. And I'd love to, to hear those thank words you. of encouragement. Thank, <laughs> yes, you. thank you. I'm glad you liked it. <laughs> and uh, before we, we move on, uh, Bia, I wanted to yeah. say thank you. Thank you for uh, what I consider a very inspirational talk. I want to also thank everyone who is here today to watch this live talk and those also who have been following us uh, every week. Uh, please note that next Saturday and Sunday, so June 5th and 6th from 2 p.m. to 5.30 Eastern, uh, please don't miss the 15th U.S. Spiritist Symposium. As uh, last year, this will be a virtual symposium which will center mediums and mediumship. And I want all of you to please join us for the celebration of the 160th anniversary of the Medium's Book. Uh, please note that we will resume our talks uh, on Saturday, June 19th at 11 a.m. So two weeks from now, the June 19th, we, I'm sorry, three weeks from now, uh, we'll resume at 11 a.m. And Paulo Bispo, he is our guest and he will talk about the influence of the spirit in cell physiology. I want to take this opportunity to thank you and uh, wish everyone a great weekend to enjoy the Memorial Day, uh, as Bia mentioned, the Memorial Day this Monday. It's a day here in the U.S. that we reserve to honor all of those who have served. And at this point, I want to say thank you for your service. And everyone, please be safe. Please have a great day. But I want to ask Bia, can you please close the live uh, talk with a prayer? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Let's all take a moment to elevate our thoughts, to think about God and Jesus and those divine lessons. Thank you for having us all here today, united virtually, to learn these messages, to better understand these lessons. And please help us going forward to be able to be inspired by these messages and include them into our day-to-day -day lives. Be with us today and always in this Memorial Day weekend. And so be it. <laughs>